welcome to a brand new Amash program. You're in for an interesting ride. This is the Amash Files. internetradio.com Hello and welcome to program 49 of the Amash Files on yet another thoroughly rained on week. And it is the 22nd of September, 2015. And you know me well enough now, folks, to know that it's a little bit after 11 o'clock. Now, we nearly didn't get on because we were having massive technical issues. We may have a little virusy thing going on, but you know what? Vin saved the day, and so you're not seeing the Amash material at the back there, but we've got Vin. So thank you, Vin. Fantastic. So I hope you enjoy the show, folks, and bear with us for any technical shenanigans that may um, eventuate throughout the program. Now, um, <laughs> it's just a quick reminder to let you know, first of all, let me get down to the details of Things Amash. The conference or the workshop on the 31st of October, which is a Saturday down in the Hastings area, is um, filling up. So, folks, I have to also arrange a light lunch for all you guys. So if you want to come along to that, please do. Please let me know. Please book your uh, seats or your place via the Amash website, which you probably know now is www.amash .co.uk or www.alienabductionuk.com. Now, this is a forensic dowsing workshop, and I know you've heard me mention this before, but this is unique. You know, this is a new set of tools, a new methodology that allows us into the ET world through the magnetic field real time and it allows us to gather analysis and data and we can get down to very fine details so this workshop is going to teach you some very basic tools but you will be able to go out in your own field in your own location and you'll be able to feed back and what we're hoping to do is to start gathering data from this system soon now we've got three fabulous guys who are doing that at the moment one's a retired physicist and uh, you know he said that if he had had this tool and known of it when he was a working physicist, that would have saved him a huge amount of time. So I really don't want you guys to miss this because no one else really knows about this methodology. It's birthing in the UK, it's birthing right here and now. And although these guys have been working for the last 20 years in dowsing and ancient archeology, span it's only in the last four, really since the time of match has been going, interestingly enough, that they began to see anomalous results in their readings, and these turned out to be ET related. And now that's just not in ancient archeology span either, let me tell you, this is current. And what is so amazing about what they are finding is that they are seeing confederations, they are seeing bodies of fleets, they are seeing real time wars going on throughout the cosmos, and they're logging all of this, and they are noting um, the impact that it's having around and how our solar system is involved. I mean, this is this is real. This is this is not conspiracies. This is not, you know, fantasy or imagination. This is real. So this is an opportunity for you guys to find it um, for, out for yourselves, and so it can become real for you. And you know, it's really exciting, and you know, we are so fortunate to have this methodology turn up at this time in humanity's development because I think it is. It's a very simple tool and it's actually easy to learn, but it is just the doing of it and accepting that this can be a fact. It's often the way when things are simple, we can't quite accept it. So um, now I want to tell you about a major experience that I, I had last Thursday, which is the 17th of September. Um, now, I've always said, as um, founder of Amash and all of that, I have never really been prone to paranormal experiences 
or um, visions or, or anything that a lot of people have. You know, I'm just extraordinarily grounded and anchored in this 3D reality. Now, I have experienced a lot of, um, especially in the developing years, my younger years, um, psychic attacks and some extraordinary things in the second year of a mash that were uh, you know, very challenging. But nevertheless, um, I had the tools and skills to deal with that. So apart from that, there's been nothing else except until last Thursday. Now, what was really interesting about this is that I was um, impressed, let's call it. So another friend might say compelled because she actually had the same experience, but 14 hours later in terms of this next little part of the story. And that is that I was impressed to put a candle in each of my rooms. And I have a maisonette, so I have some stairs. Um, so as I'd finished, and also then to take some incense around, incense around the room, and that's sort of reaffirming um, protection that only the highest and the best can, can you know, enter and interact, all of that. Anyway, it was really interesting because almost as I was going around, I, 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 it was as if I was not really thinking those those intentions, but but just kind of knew them. So as if something else was, was with me, but um, that was very subtle. So as I'm going up the stairs, about halfway up, I suddenly felt like I'd walked into another energy field because uh, I felt like 100 eyes watching me. It was really super intense. And then my whole body and physicality went cold from head to foot, but extreme. This isn't just a little chill. This is like somebody had opened a freezer and had walked into it and accompanied by this tingling. So that kind of stopped me uh, right in my steps there on my tracks. And then I carried on upstairs and thought, OK, let's, let's kind of observe. OK, so that was all right. I did feel a bit spooked. And that was it. So I came back down, finished a bit of work, and I probably ended up going to bed about two, and I was really tired, so I slept quite quickly. Only to wake up maybe an hour or two later, not anymore, I'm sure, because it was still very dark. And um, I woke up. I was sleeping on my left side, which is turned toward the wall and the window and all very dark. And I wanted to turn over to my right side. Now, my right side face would face the inside of the room then and, and the door. Now, um, I don't normally wake up to turn over. And, and I couldn't turn over either. Now, in the past, I uh, have been subject to paralysis, this very common um, uh, thing that people experience, um, but never anything else. And, and I'm not a person who can uh, relax, go with it, and you know, perhaps just burst like a bubble out of my body and astral travel. I, I just can't do it. I have to fight it. I'm just wired that way, and that's that. So anyway, it wasn't paralysis, but it was as if I was kind of bound by some magnetic energy or, or, or some field, let's call it a field. Um, and and I, my breathing began to change as I began to go into panic mode and fight mode <laughs> slightly. And then I heard myself say, it was my voice inside, thinking, saying, just let me turn over, please. Now, who was I talking to? I mean, for goodness sake. So with that, I, I could turn over. And I realized I'd fallen asleep with my laptop right by my, by my side, by the side of my bed, and, and pretty near my head. Now, I know you shouldn't do all of that stuff, but anyway, I do. So I went to, because the power light was pulsing a bit, I went to turn, turn it off. But I was going to take the plug out of the socket, which requires being awake. So I'm, I'm now awake. I'm not half asleep. I was when I was turning over, but, but that kind of experience of the breathing woke me right up. And as I went to, with the thought of taking the plug out, I suddenly noticed a haze, um, the best description, it wasn't really a light, more like a haze in the middle of the room. And then in this haze was a man. Uh, so I reckon he'd probably be about 12 feet away from my bed. Um, and he was, uh, I'd say he was about five foot eight, very slender. He was wearing 60s kind of styled outfit. He was wearing dark trousers um, and, and a shirt with what's called, what we used to call a tank top, that woolen sleeveless uh, top. And um, he had a, a dark beard and dark hair. I mean, I would recognize him in the street if I saw him. He, it was that clear. Um, and he was definitely human, and he just gave a little, he was almost face on to me, not quite, maybe 80% face on to me. And he gave a little wave with his left hand, and um, like a sort of cheerio or, or whatever. And I thought, what the hell? And as I was, the what the hell came out of my thoughts, uh, I didn't say it. Um, he disappeared and in his place, but slightly nearer to me by another two or three feet, was a being. Um, very tall, maybe six, seven foot, uh, but 90 degree on to me. Uh, so I only saw them in profile and the head was hunched down, shoulders hunched over. And um, they were 
you know, I just was aware of their skinniness and their, their tallness, and they'd got everything tucked in as if they were making themselves as small as possible to me. But the one thing that they couldn't really make small and that I had very good, a very good visual on, and this is 3D visioning now, this is not me being half asleep, um, was their arm. Now, if I just show you, if I have my arm tucked into my side like that, and then I flop my hand over, okay, like that, um, that's sort of a 90 degree angle. Well, the, the appendage from their wrist was like a hand, I suppose, was another, was twice the size of mine lengthwise. And, and also it went, it flexed by about 45 degrees. So I know some double jointed people can, you know, get their thumb to touch their, their arm. I'm not one of those, but um, so it, it, we have seen it in humans, but this was naturally resting at at least 45 degree angle, if not a 40 degree angle, which is very unusual. And it didn't have a hand. It was more like, um, I don't know whether it's pincers or a little, I don't know what that was. But anyway, the head wasn't big that I could tell. I don't know how far it had got its chin tucked down, but it looked sort of a rounded top. So I don't know whether I was looking at, I was clearly looking at some kind of insectoid being first time in my life and this was uh, a, a big surprise and shock and what was interesting too um, this whole event probably lasted no more than 10 seconds maybe eight uh, I don't know something like that and uh, but there was no fear absolutely no fear it was just as if I was observing and uh, it almost I could say looked like I was looking at a hologram I don't know if I was or not, but, you know, the haze screen thing and, and the human going and anyway, all of that. And there were no smells. There was no telepathic communication. There was nothing at all. And the being, the creature kind of dissolved and disappeared away along with the, the haze. And then I unplugged my computer and I thought, oh, my God, shall I put the light on to sleep? Well, I don't sleep well in the light. So I thought, don't be silly. You know, <laughs> it's gone. Go, go to sleep. So the house the next day was so it's just last Friday was a little bit um, um, energetic. So I was still kind of feeling a little bit at sixes and sevens energetically and thought, oh my God, now I've talked to several people about this and some people think that it's contact being initiated. And I must say, when I have said, uh, put out for contact, I only want personally diplomatic contact, intermediary contact, um, hum humane contact. I don't want to be terrified. I'd, I want to understand and I, and I want to do it educationally. So, you know, I don't want any genetic tissue, take none of that anyway. So it's almost as if my, my intentions were met because I was shielded from any fear or anything like that. And, and, and I don't feel any fear speaking about it either. So uh, the reason I, I wanted to share this with you is because, A, I don't consider myself an experience. Maybe I'm becoming one. I don't know. I'll keep you posted. Um, but also, uh, maybe this is a new phase for humanity in general, because if I'm going through this material manifestation and, and this doesn't happen to me, generally speaking, then, uh, you know, to me, it's like a signal that something may be going on and someone actually said, well, maybe I'm also going up to another level of development with the steps and the symbology of that. Who knows what? Uh, we can read all kinds of things into that. So I also heard that there was a massive earthquake in Chile around Wednesday uh, into Thursday and that, in fact, the earth was continuing to quake. Now, I haven't followed that up. I don't know if the earth is still continuing to quake, but it was for quite a long time. Now, because this was such a massive earthquake, I just wondered if the mass of mag the magnetic fields was so displaced, was so disturbed, that that allowed, if you like, a window of opportunity for someone to connect with me, you know, the ripple effect of the magnetic um, energy uh, being impacted, um, you know. Anyway, that, that was just what I wanted to say. So it's just very strange. And um, the final thing I want to say about on the MASH front, going away from that experience now, is that um, I will be uh, hosting a workshop with two other very powerful people, uh, ladies. It's like the A-team have to come out now. <laughs> And um, we're going to be doing a combination of work with, on the Amash side of things, looking at the history of ET, looking at what the implications are for humanity now. And then the next presenter, Anne Holsworth, will be taking center stage as a practitioner of yoga, but not, as you know it, she works with breathing in a very dynamic way. And she's a burn practitioner, amongst other things. And she has been working energetically with some very incredible energies. And she's going to be working using the, the breath with the physical and taking us through some very deep, incredible work with that. We'll be finishing off the day with Cecilia Martinez, who has traveled a lot of the world 
and part of it with a world leader <clears throat> who will currently still be nameless um, for safety reasons. And this world leader, who's no longer with us, sadly, they were assassinated, um, took on board her own spiritual and personal development. And Cecilia was essentially her guide and guardian. And this person actually uh, was beginning to work um, on their role, with their role as leader of their country, using these spiritual values. So, you know, what a joy and what an amazing thing that will be. And um, she's thinking about divulging the name and sharing that with you um, at the workshop. But also she'll be taking us through some of the extraordinary experiences she's been through abroad in the Philippines with Sixto Paz Wells, with the ET contact. So it is going to be an absolutely fully Day. So I hope you can be with us. There, it's probably going to be November, December time. There will be um, there will be uh, details about that on the events page of the Amash website. And um, when you hit the event, events page, it is the events tab itself under which um, the details are. So people get confused and click on the next one and wonder why they don't see the information. All right, well, on to my guest. So um, before we get on to my guest, we will have a song, but I'm just going to say that love is indeed a theme for this evening, and that is also reflected in my wonderful guest, whose name is Bradley Loves. Now, because of our incredible technical <laughs> dance this evening, Vin is going to delight us with a musical surprise. So Vin, when you're ready, you hit that spin button, my dear, and we'll just go for it. And I'll be bringing Bradley Loves to you when we'll be talking about AI, ET, Dracos, and an awful lot more. Stay with us, the Amash Files. That was wonderful. Thank you very much, Vin, for um, looking after us on the musical side. And I am very, very delighted and relieved to be inviting Bradley Loves onto the Amash Files. Uh, thank you very much for being with us, Bradley. I don't know um, where is it, Colorado? You're 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 in. You're not California, right. that's for sure. No, no, I'm in Grand Junction, Colorado. Okay, all right. Well, Bradley, um, I always have a curiosity about the beginnings of people's realization and the path that they follow, and I think most people are fascinated by that element too. So. I think if we could start by just finding out a little bit about you. I mean, let's go back to the young child who I know that you didn't take <laughs> from our chat anything at face value and you questioned your uh, adults around you. So let's hear a little bit about that because I think that sort of set the platform for the rest of your life and where we're going with tonight's talk. All right. Well, yeah. Um... I'm probably about as young as three or four years old, I, um, I had an epiphany, and that epiphany was simply that I was in the wrong place. I was on the wrong planet. Uh, <laughs> everything that was happening around me made no sense. And the way people were doing things and the um, and, and, and just the ideals and, and the desires and the goals of, um, of the adults around me just, I thought, were ludicrous. And um, I was a very challenging child. I was a very challenging boy. And I just, um, I, um, I put it directly to my parents constantly. Why are you doing it like that? I mean, it doesn't make sense. Why would people act this way? Or why would they act that way? And uh, it was very clear to me that I wasn't really fitting in. And um, it, that, it just went on from there. Yeah, so you, you did go to university uh, or college, mm -hmm. <clears throat> not sure if it was university, but to actually study um, be to become an accounting attorney or an accountant and an attorney, I'm not quite sure which. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, you spent quite a while doing that, a few years, huh? Yeah, I know. I, I was uh, three years at the university and I, um, I, I took pretty much everything I could get my hands on. I was a, a classical accounting and, and business law uh, physics, mathematics, um, pretty much anything that I thought might be useful, uh, philosophy. But in the end, what I decided was that if I was going to live an honest life, if I was going to live a life that did not create what I believe was harm, if not create harm for any other living being, that I would have to stop because it was my 
my thought and my position that what I was being trained to do was ultimately going to hurt people yeah. in, in very subtle ways. And, I, and, I just, and you, were, you were mentioning, sorry to interrupt, Bradley, you were mentioning at one time in our, in our pre-show chat that you said that, that what you were being asked to do constantly was massage figures, basically lie constantly about what you were showing people. Well, you know, everything boils down to very subtle, you know, in the end. It's, of course, they wouldn't have said you're lying. They would have said this is how to do it, you know. And I was just smart enough to see through all that. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so you you came out of college, I, I take it, or university, um, and then where did that life take you then? Well, I, I, everyone around me thought I was nuts. I was an absolute lunatic for you know being so close to a degree and then not finishing. But what I uh, what I thought was that I could do better if I was to just design my own life, create my own life in my own way. And uh, I picked a, a career that I thought was honorable and uh, something that was creative and something that I could do and uh, come home and look at myself in the mirror and say, yeah, I like that guy. Okay. And that was carpentry. You know, I, uh, I didn't want to be a financial analyst or an accountant and push pins around and, and revalue things such that while certain people were making a whole lot of money, others were losing a whole lot of money. Yeah. You know? Yeah, indeed. Yeah, I understand. So uh, anyway, you know, I, I think that's, um, it's not often that I come across people who um, have you know, the will and, and the courage to do that, because I know that will be in the face of, um, you know, fly in the face of peers and, um, you know, your parents and <laughs> higher ups in the uh, human uh, contact. So, um, you know, congratulations. H did you make the right choice? Yes, yes, I think I did. I was a very strange little boy. When I was mowing the lawn when I was like seven years old, I would go around the circles and contemplating the existence of God and, and eternity, you know, and other <laughs> things. Yeah. <laughs> very rarely did I get on with uh, little kids my age. Most of the times I wanted to spend with adults because they were talking about things that at least made a little bit of sense. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, um, I wanted to really kick off with, um, uh, you, you gave me, a, you have a, a blog site, and it's called mm -hmm. The Masters of Love, and mm -hmm. I'll put that, that information will be on the podcast page, folks, so you can see that there. Um, uh, Bradley has two sites, uh, or, or two aspects of the site, one free and one that is a subscription, and the free one um, has a, a wonderful article called The Great Con of Man. And this talk tonight is going to go into the depths of AI as far as we have time to do so, um, as well as ET and all things allied. But first of all, we're going to go and explore the hoodwinking majorly of humanity over the eons. And that is indeed what the great con of man is about. And it's an excellent article, about 80 pages. And I have to tell you and be quite honest that I didn't get through the 80 pages because um, having to <laughs> pay attention elsewhere to some tech stuff and all the rest of it, but I got a very, very good gist. And you're, you are so on target for the PIR, People's Internet Radio, philosophy and ethos, because it's mm. all about sovereignty and it's all about solutions. Mm. And that is exactly what you're talking about. And also these folks, a lot of the folks here are very skilled and schooled in um, helping people with the law and helping people maintain their homes, helping people maintain their lives, because mm. there is so much distress and despair going on, on an everyday, every man, woman level. And these guys are right at the coal face. So I really appreciate you, Bradley, with what you were saying in the Great Con. And I think we should explore some of that because you did say to me, you know, some of this stuff that the new, I'm just going to call them the New World Order, the Illum Illuminati, we can label all we want, but you know where I'm coming from with that. Yes. Um, use black magic. Well, that wasn't any news to me. That is exactly yeah. what they're doing. But I don't know whether anybody else will see it in those terms. But as I often say, we have to use words. And this is as good a description as it gets, very basically, about what's 
been happening to humanity and it is the black art. So mm -hmm. um, Bradley, I'd love you to, to start the ball rolling with just some of your, <clears throat> your thoughts from that very interesting article about the great con of mankind. And we're looking at what words mean and the real issue behind the word and how that impacts humans. Well, yeah, well, that's a can of worms because um, it really does get very deep and very um, complicated quite fast. Um, let's just start out with a simple idea that words do not mean what we think they mean, okay? Our language uh, has been given to us. Um, most uh, spiritually enlightened civilizations, and now when I say spiritually enlightened civilizations, I'm talking about other planets, not this one, um, have uh, telepathy as a, a means of communication. And that means that they speak mind to mind, and they speak in images. Most uh, advanced civilizations speak in pictures. They don't use words and they don't use sounds. Uh, sounds have a tendency to create geometry. A geometry is a creative force, or a sound is a creative force. It can do all kinds of things. And um, I don't know if many people know this, but when you speak, the vibration of your voice actually causes, um, it causes vibration, which then causes geometry to take shape. And there are several videos over the internet under the, uh, the name uh, of cymatics. If you uh, C Y M A T I C S. If you look up cymatics, you can see that um, taking a, a, a sound generator and, and pushing a tone into a metal plate will actually um, cause a very dry media to turn into geometry. So that being said, we, uh, we as human beings really don't know what our words are doing. We don't know what our words are actually creating. And um, what ended up happening was a while back, and I think a lot of people already know this, that hum the human uh, body was genetically altered such that we don't have the ability to be telepathic anymore, like we used to be. And um, we had to start speaking in words. Mm. And those words then were taught to us. And the reason those words were given to us in the way they are, and this is all languages, it's not just the English language, but it's all languages, was so that we would create our own enslavement by using words. Okay? So... The only people who actually understand language really well are those who are well-versed in black magic. And they understand how words can entrap people. And uh, when we got into the great con of man, I started showing people how certain words that they were using in, in a courtroom setting were actually entrapping them and actually causing them to um, admit or consent to things that they didn't want. Well, you'll be speaking to the heart of PIR here, mm -hmm. so I think it's worth just spending a little bit of time on those particular words, contract and consent. Uh, I know you hadn't mentioned contract, but I am, um, just because of the PIR uh, orientation here, and I think it's also very valuable for everybody to hear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, contract and consent, those two words are very interesting because I call them the evil twins. Uh, and the, the reason I call them evil twins is because in my world, if you put con in front of a word, con is a negative. So contract and consent, that means something negative. Um, what I wrote in the great con is that all contracts are magic spells. Okay, and the reason that all contracts are magic spells is because there is a supernatural level, okay? What is the purpose of a contract? The purpose of a contract is to bind. It is to bind a living human being, a living soul, to an agreement, okay? And 
if it wasn't uh, a binding, and if it wasn't meant to leave no alternative, then why would lawyers use the words, I've got an ironclad contract with this person? Ultimately, what we're talking about here is binding human beings' free will. Free will is a gift. It is a gift from our creator. It is a gift from the universe. It is a gift from source. We all have free will. And it is a cosmic crime. It is a cosmic level crime for any human being to trespass against the free will of another living human being. Now, those people who wanted to take over this planet, and I'm talking about ETs, those uh, beings who wanted to control human beings living here knew that they couldn't do it and not suffer grave consequences on a cosmic level. So what they did was they gave the Earth and all people living here the ancient law of contracts. And the reason they did that was so that by getting used to using contracts, human beings on Earth would be more ready to hand over their free will in such a way that it wasn't a crime or it wasn't, um, it wasn't trespassing against another's free will because when two people contract, now you're giving consent. And the consent is actually marked with what they call a signature. A signet is a seal or a mark of consent. So if a person or two beings enter into a contract, then of course, one person is giving consent to another person to do something that otherwise might be uh, karmically not so good. Sure. So we're going to just draw this forward. So, folks, I, I, um, I know a lot of the people here at PIR are very well schooled in, in what Bradley's talking about, but the article is extremely good, <clears throat> and it goes into looking at many, many other words. But I really want to move on here a little bit and just draw this, um, <clears throat> this information and, and thought uh, through to the reptilians and the ETs. And then we're going to sort of, again, get into the AI side of things. But let's just talk. <clears throat> and also, um, perhaps we just leave, before we leave that, we just talk about the Catholic Church and about baptism and what you have to say about that. And then we'll get into the Dracos, reptilians, and how they hijacked us. <clears throat> Well, the, the Catholic Church is, is, is a corporation. It's an institution, and, and it's very, uh, very much on the business side and the contract side. Um, it, the, the idea that it represents anything spiritual is, is ludicrous. Okay? I, it, 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 is a, um, it is a corporation, and it represents an aspect of administration if you will. It is an administrator. It's an on-world administrator for an off-world group. Okay? And that's as, that's as nice as I can put it. You know, it, it has its tentacles into everything because, of course, when you have an off-world controlling group, as the Earth does, then you need administrators. And the Catholic Church is part, not all, but part of that administration. Do you think that has um, that there is something special going down with the Pope over in uh, your neck of the woods at the moment? <clears throat> well, yeah, he's he's here to um, do what he's being told to do to his job. He's ultimately uh, I've uh, pre basically predicted on as I wrote an article this morning about what he was going to say, even though I haven't seen any of his speeches. He's gonna he's gonna basically lay out. A, a a vision of what's wrong with the world. He's going to say that the poor are suffering, and he's going to say that uh, that the uh, the corporations are greedy, and he's going to say that the oligarchs are hoarding all kinds of money, and that we're that as a group we're all poisoning the planet, and and there's all kinds of horrible things going on. And he's going to lay, and then he's going to admonish everyone. 
and say, this isn't right. We shouldn't have this. Then he's going to come back and give a solution. We need a global government. And, that, and what we really need to do is hand over control over to the few people who just really have the planet's um, goodness and, and, and goodness in their hearts. So that's what, what he's going to come here to say. And he's going to lay out a case for it. And it's going to sound really great. But unfortunately, it's basically, uh, you know, the wolf in sheep's clothing. Oh, yeah, no doubt about it. So um, what, what was your, uh, to, I want you to just address Ash Wednesday and baptism. And then we will, I promise, get you moving on. <laughs> Ash Wednesday. Well, Ash Wednesday, here's the thing that I, I've discovered, and, and I've looked into this. Every every day, or, or whole, what they call holy day or holiday, because that's what holy day is. It's a holiday. Is a a, a renewal date for the church. It's a renewal of contracts. Okay. When I said that um, there is a supernatural level to all contracts that you enter into, I wasn't joking about that. We have to start thinking in terms of other levels, just from what can be seen. You know, even the idea that you sign a banknote or that you sign a mortgage or that you sign something, which is a contract and it's a magic spell that binds you, don't for a minute think that there isn't a supernatural side to that contract now that you've bound yourself to. Because when you're dealing with the church, you're dealing with magical people. You're dealing with magicians. You're dealing with old mystery school, um, esoteric sciences, and they deal with the black arts. Yeah. So, and uh, treaties and all negotiations that are going on on the planet. You know, people enter into these things all day long thinking, oh, there's no harm, no fall, just sign a contract, and then I won't keep up my end of the bargain. Well, when they drag you into court <laughs> for not keeping up your end of the bargain, there's black magic going on, and you will get the result of, the, um, of what you promised, you know, in a binding. So I, I don't like to use contracts knowing yes. what kind of um, hokey pokey is going on with those things. Mm. So you're just going back and just going to drag you back to Ash Wednesday. <clears throat> I was okay. interested in what you said about that. Just and the, the cross and the forehead and the ash and all the rest yeah, of Yeah, well, it's interesting for people to hear. It's, it's, it's words, again. You know, there, if you were born Catholic and I was born but Catholic. But also the action that you right. When you when you walk up on Ash Wednesday, they 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 give you a little spiel and they tell you, remember, man, that you are dust, and into dust you shall return. Well, th there's a lot of symbology, and of course, words mean something. You know, it what's basically going on is uh, um, the priest is is performing an incantation or a curse, and uh, the dust word, of course, is like dirt. OK, and it's basically they, they put a, a cross in ashes and ashes are dust on your forehead, which is your third eye area. And your third eye is your uh, mystical sight, your magical sight into the higher realms. So what they're doing is they're performing a, a magical act that is kind of closing off that symbolically they're closing your third eye and putting dirt there, or dust, which basically is symbolic of um, uh, just a curse, in my opinion. That's, that's the way I put it, and, and they're, they're closing that down. So that was my take on the whole thing. But, you know, if you no, read I think the that's article... It's really, uh, you know, really interesting, and I think that's very viable and, and valuable. Totally different, uh, you know, I'm not used to all the different religious processes and, uh, and, you know, ceremonies, but, you know, I know about, you know, you hear about these things. So <clears throat> what's your take on baptism? Well, that, that's a contract again. That's the first contract because he hears the thing. As I said, every living human being is born 
a, a child of the source, a prime creator, a god, if you will. Okay, but we're talking about the source god, not the small gods. And um, we, as children of this creator father, his greatest gift to us is free will. No, And if he gave it, then no one can take it. No one Does it can have to be a he? It well, I use the <laughs> word he, forgive me, you know, not being very politically correct here. <laughs> Just ask. Um, yes, no. Um, I, I would, I dare say that source is is neither he nor she. Oh, no, no, I, <laughs> that, I, I agree. That I'm source just, is just having a little fun with you there. Oh, I, oh, I appreciate it. <laughs> but um, if we're born with free will, then no one can take it. All right, it has to be in order for someone else then to have power over you, control, or tell you what to do, you have to give away your free will. Now, your parents, when you're baptized, are told and convinced and taught and programmed to believe that in order for your soul to be saved, that they have to hand you over to the church through a process or a sacrament. And if you look up the word sacrament, you'll find out that that's basically agreement <laughs> or contract, you know, just as uh, 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 the, uh, you know, other words like that are. Um, but through this agreement, you hand over your free will, see, because you, here's what you're doing. You're saying, okay, do you want to be in our organization and, you know, follow all of our rules? Um, here's what here here's a good analogy. Every time you get on the internet in in a in a Starbucks, they they give you this little page and say, "Do you agree to all our terms?" Here, click on here if you want to read our terms, which is 500 pages long. Okay, or do you just want to say, "Yes, I accept your terms and agree to everything that I've never read"? Well, that's exactly what baptism is. They say, "Do you want to be part of our church and agree to all of our terms?" magical as they are, and, and the fact that we never told you what they are. So your parents go, yes, we want you, we want our child, because we're terrified that he won't go to heaven, okay? So they hand over uh, the child's soul, and then the church binds it under contract, okay? So now the church basically has the right, because the parents gave over through their free will, uh, and their right to speak for the child, they gave over uh, the child's free will, and now the church can do anything they want to that child hmm. because under it's under contract. Yeah, well, apparently Jesus wants me for a sunbeam. I, I was the only one of us baptized, and um, I think my parents did it not because they were religious. They couldn't really care less, I don't think, but they probably thought it was a nice idea or somebody suggested it, and I was the first. So, um, hey, anyway, I'm going to have to break that contract now, I know, and I don't want to be that sunbeam. <laughs> Well, yeah, I, you know, and here's the thing, almost all these churches have some form of baptism. And the Catholic Church, of course, is very, um, they keep up with it, though, because then when you get to be about 12 or 13 now, the church realizes that, yes, the parents had the right to speak for the child up until a certain point, but the child is soon going to be an adult, and then it can speak for itself. So what we need to do is renew the contract, and that's where confirmation comes in, because yeah. now we are going to reconfirm the contract, and now this time the child himself, pushed forward by his parents, agrees to all of the terms and all of the conditions of the contract for the rest of his life. Huh. Yeah, in, indeed. Absolutely, indeed. I'd really like you to just, uh, I'm really am going to wrap up on this subject in a second, but I just made one or two notes and I, and I, I thought they were just very interesting. Um, <clears throat> I know some of the PR people, this won't be news news too, but uh, for other people listening, it will be. But I just want you to um, just talk about Judge Dale for a minute. I hadn't come across him. And um, his work, The Great American, something or other, I'm sorry, I can't read the my The Great mind. American Adventure, yeah. Adventure. Well, yeah, Judge Dale is a 85-year-old retired judge. Um, and he is a gentleman who basically, uh, he wrote a book or an online e-book called The Great American Adventure. 
And basically what ended up happening was once judges get to a certain level uh, in, in their tenure, they are basically told. Not all the judges in the beginning are told, but they are basically told that, guess what? This is all black magic. You really don't have authority over human beings like you think you do. This all comes down from canon law. This is all church law, ecclesiastical law, but it's all black magic. And that you really don't have the authority to put people in jail like you think you do um, unless they consent to it. Okay, and that's the important thing. Judge Dale told me that um, no, nobody goes to jail without their consent. Now, as I wrote in The Great Con of Man, how they get that consent from you is the magic, because that's the whole thing. It, the, every court, um, every court proceeding is as a dog and pony show. It's a magic trick. It's a magic show, and it basically, it, all of it is there to intimidate you beyond your ability to even think properly. Yeah. And they and they true. intimidate you in every way in order to make you believe that they have a right to um, lord over authority over you. But they can only do that if you allow them to yeah. or if you surrender to that. Otherwise, they don't. Yeah. Because... That would be like saying one human soul has the right to direct and enslave another human soul. And that's not true. Yeah. It is It is really interesting. And um, there is a PDF um, uh, of that uh, book. And if I can source it, I'll put it in. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, I can't get into the chat, folks. So I, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll put it onto the... Um, podcast page um, later on and uh, hopefully you can read that if you're interested so anyway we're now kind of going down the road here to dracos and reptilians atlanteans all those guys so let's pick up a story where um you know planet earth is perhaps seen as a i don't know a tool a prize something like that along with humanity and reptilians are um, hybrid reptilians Mm -hmm. that may be known as the Anunnaki in our histories, maybe not, who knows, um, make a, a, you know, entrance, stage right. <laughs> well, see, this has always been my fascination, is ancient history. And uh, I'm just curious enough and, uh, and tenacious enough to have spent my entire life digging and my entire life looking and, and reading and talking to people. And believe it or not, there are those that know, especially if you're some people are, who are in the CIA or the secret military and beyond that. Insiders, people who have used to be uh, affiliated with the Illuminati, they, they know this story. I mean, it's not a, it's not a total secret. It can be, it can be figured out. And, um, if you want to get into the Draco, well, where do you start? The Draco are the um, the current administrators of our planet. They are here as a result of a war that took place about 26,000 years ago, uh, and it involved the Atlanteans. Now, the Atlanteans came far before that. The Atlanteans arrived here perhaps, oh, 150,000 years ago. And they came in a ship. They came in a huge, very advanced ship and landed here. And at that time, the people who were living on the planet were very spiritual and very magical and uh, very advanced in the arts of uh, telepathy and telekinesis and teleportation and all kinds of things that the people could do, spiritual people could do with their minds. These, of course, are not the same version of human that we are. They were far more advanced. Uh, just so that people can understand what I'm talking about, the version of the human body that we are living in right now, I would say is probably the most stripped down version of human that you can possibly get and still call it a human. So for those of you who are out there thinking, well, we must be the most advanced <laughs> thing out there. If you're Darwinist, you know, you've got it backwards. You know, we we are the least 
we are the least advanced version of human out in, in the galaxy. And the galaxy is full of humans. Uh, but they're more advanced than we are. Now, the Draco came uh, 26,000 years ago after the war of, uh, the, uh, with Atlantis, and, and the solar system was in a huge mess. Uh, there was a planet between Jupiter and Mars called Tiamat, which had been blown into oblivion because of the war, and many of the other planets in the solar system had been uh, really knocked out of their orbits and, and stuff as well. A lot, a lot of damage, and the Earth humans were very um, were very traumatized. And when the Draco showed up, they offered to help. Okay. Now the Draco are probably some of the biggest, baddest, and most uh, feared people in the galaxy. Like and, the Mafia, uh, I imagine. Yeah, yeah. And uh, they said, "Well, you know," we'll, and the Earth humans, being as traumatized they were because of this war, this solar system-wide war. Uh, a very highly technologically advanced war. Um, the Draco said, okay, well, we'll protect you, but uh, you have to do something for us. And, and, the, and the, the people who were left on the planet Earth said, well, what? And they, and they said, we want the planet. That's what we want. We want Earth. And the people basically said, well, okay, anything, just protect us. And of course, they were advised against it. Everybody said, no, don't make a deal with the Draco. You have no clue what you're getting yourselves into. But they, they felt like, well, what else, what other choice have we got? So the Draco, for 13,000 years, they basically fulfilled their end of the bargain. They rebuilt Earth. They, they protected Earth. And they gave all of the human beings on Earth um, extremely advanced technology. And they built a major uh, civilization in the Sahara Desert, where, where Egypt is right now. And guess what the name of it was? Go on. It was called Utopia. Uh -huh. That was the name of it. So human beings were living in this utopia. And as uh, luck would have it, because the Draco were a very warlike a bunch of beings, um, uh, some of the people that they were fighting in other places came here and decided to attack. And they leveled the, this grand civilization in the Sahara Desert and uh, blew it to smithereens about 13,000 years ago. So the Draco this time, instead of being Earth's administrators and babysitters, they said, you know, we're tired of this. We've, done, we've kept our end of the bargain for 13,000 years, and now we have other plans for Earth. And those other plans were to use Earth humans as a slave race. So then they started the genetic manipulation. Now, the humans that were on Earth before 13,000 years ago were very genetically different than we are. They didn't look different, they just were genetically different. And what the Draco did is they genetically created a much dumb, dumber version of human beings, if you will. They disconnected their DNA down to two strands such that we didn't have telepathy, we didn't have the ability to communicate with each other, we lost most of our magical abilities, and we could basically be used in any way, shape, or form they chose. And then that's basically what happened when we started getting languages. They started giving us words to use instead of te telepathy, because we didn't have telepathy. But the words they gave us to use were words that could be manipulated, and words that could be changed around, and words that could actually entrap us and enslave us. So, yeah, yeah. And, and well, that, that the, actually, you know, you can feel that, and um, you know, that it's kind of obvious to me um, that that is exactly, you know, part of what's going on. And as you were talking about the geometries and things like cymatics, I actually um, spent quite a long time around a guy called Sir Peter Guy Manners, 
I don't know if he was knighted, but anyway, he called himself Sir Peter Guy Manners, who was a very unusual man. He reckoned he was a Venusian. I can't ver verify that. But he was a, a, a master of cymatics, that's for sure, and in a therapeutic way. And I did some very um, interesting little vids of him back in 95, when I was a mere gal, <laughs> of interviewing him um, and uh, his work. But I wish I'd filmed the backstory, which was really much more interesting and, and how he came to be where where he was, uh, but that is, you know, amazing. So you and you got to really have an understanding of the importance of these structures on on the human form and the human psyche and the human uh, subtle energetic fields and magnetic fields as well. Mm -hmm. And I might say that just going back to the forensic dowsing, they're reading the magnetic element of the fields. Mm -hmm. That's where they're getting the information, not the radio waves, the microwaves, mm -hmm. gamma rays. They can pick all of those up read those, but that's not why they're seeing specifically uh, the information, which is incredibly detailed, I may say as well, mm -hmm. from their work. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. So uh, let's just take this a bit further then, and um, let's sort of venture into the AI world. But perhaps before we do, let's give everybody and, and you a little bit of a break. And if Vin can spin as a magic song, <laughs> I don't know if I dare say <laughs> Some wonderful words <laughs> with a bit of music. We'll have a, a little break and then we'll come back and we'll delve into AI. Um, this is really fascinating. I mean, I know that we haven't even touched just even the surface of what I'd like to with you, Bradley, um, but perhaps we'll get you to come on again, even though this hasn't finished yet. <laughs> so, uh, Bradley, so we're going to talk about AI. Um, I also want to mention uh, as well the fact um, that you you uh, believe uh, you have implants, or at least you did. I don't know if you still think you do. And I'd just like to talk about a little bit about that, how you came by those implants, how you think those were, were um, put in, and what you did about those. And then we'll, we'll carry on with the AI stuff as well. It just brings it very round to the ET kind of thing as well. Well, that's a big question, too. It really is. It, You know, first of all, let, let me be clear on one thing. By the time we get down to the AI, I don't think there's anybody on the planet who really hasn't got implants anymore. I mean, I, if, if you think, oh, I've never been touched or I don't have anything happening with me, well, guess again. All right. But... The, for the rest of the people who have had more um, noticeable, noticeable reactions, I would say the reason that happens is because almost from the very beginning of your incarnation here, the Draco and those that work for the Draco have the ability to um, identify who you are. They identify your soul by through your frequency. And... Um, they, because they run the planet, and and it is their agenda to have a very negative uh, society here. Anybody who ha is filled with love or light or the idea that I'm going to come here, my mission is to make changes and to help free what the Draco consider to be their herd or their cattle, and and that's what they honestly consider humans to be is their herd. Um, they uh, they take offense to that. And those people who um, come here with that sort of idea or that kind of mission, uh, they get implanted very early on because they want to be they want to track them and they want to understand what their what their frequency is saying. And, and they want there's a whole lot of things they want to know, because if that person gives off too much love energy or too much light energy uh, there, the Earth has what's called a morphogenetic field around it. Yeah. which is a field that we are all part of. And it's it's um, one light, let's just say one person with that kind of energy, like a Jesus figure, instead of being a 100-watt bulb, might be a 60,000-watt bulb. And that's an awful lot of light to be pouring onto the planet. So if, if a, um, a person comes in with that kind of mission, they are going to do their best to stand in the way 
to drag that person through the mud, to put a stop to any kind of divine thoughts or actions. And the way they do that is by traumatizing them. They yeah. have all kinds of ways to traumatize light workers. Yeah, indeed. Uh, and I'm hearing about lots of them in the work that I do and part of my work certainly on the mm -hmm. therapy point, but just um, on the, you know, counseling end is to de-traumatize. That's mm -hmm. exactly, you know, what um, I'm doing with Amash, uh, apart, apart from disseminating information and sharing information and talking to wonderful people like you who've been down that rabbit hole firmly. <laughs> um, so um, what, what have you done to, uh, well, before I ask what you did to counter the implants, uh, just describe, you talked about um, waking up one day um, with um, like a skin graft, I think. Is that how you termed it? Something yeah. quite a sizable piece. This, this isn't just a little... Yeah, um, yeah on my no. leg. It's just, yeah, it, they, they have ways of removing you from your bed and then taking you on board ship or to wherever they want to do and put implants, physical implants uh, on your person. And uh, yeah, one day I woke up and I had a sizable skin graft on my leg and I could feel three tiny, very hard objects below the skin. Just the, it would, the size of like smaller than peas, uh, maybe a little bit bigger than grains of sand, you know, like maybe yeah. BBs, that kind of size from a BB gun. But um, yeah, and, and that's just, those are physical implants. Those things are there to uh, keep track of you and, and, and do that kind of thing. And then of course they moved on um, after, after several years of having those. Um, they uh, started uh, developing what I call astral implants. And those, yeah. are Im those are implants that are not necessarily physical but they exist on an astral level. They come into your astral body and uh, they burrow into your energy at the back of the neck because the back of the neck is the um, place on your body where your aura is weakest. Your aura is a magnetic field. It's the, it's the, the practical shield of your body. And uh, naturally, if there is an energetic device that exists on that level that wants to get in, it would have to go where the uh, the shield is the weakest, and that's where it usually goes. And then it gets into your energy field or chakra system, and from there, it usually tries to um, weaken and dissipate your uh, your resolve. Yeah, no, absolutely. I've, I have had quite a bit of experience of that myself, um, and I don't know that I would say I had implants, but certainly influences that have um, tried to make me give up what I'm doing, tried to make me give up myself. You yeah. know, um, it's, it's very well, interesting, the challenges we go through. I mean, you know, I've said before, but we really are, those of us who are here doing what we're doing, we are on a hero's journey. We are heroes and heroines, my goodness, to stick with it. It's phenomenal. And, you know, I salute everybody who's still here and relatively intact. <laughs> Well, not everybody came here to actually on a mission to save humanity. There, a, a good portion of humanity is here to be saved. Okay, and and that's why you get these um, men and women who look at you like you're you're an absolute fool. They go, "What are you talking <laughs> about? Implants and, and 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 harassment and trauma and all that kind of stuff." I say, "Well, yeah, it's not happening to you because you're one of the people that are drowning, and I'm here to save you. And the reason that people like me are being attacked is because I'm I'm on a whole nother level, you know, as a yeah. soul." You know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I totally understand that. And so many people I know who are, let's call them experiences, there's no better word at the moment, um, of all kinds of shades and colors. And I'm including activists and targeted individuals because normally targeted individuals are people whose light is extraordinarily strong and they have uh, an empathetic right. nature and all, anyway, all of that. And, um, and, and we are getting shot full right, left and center. And just to maintain um, stability mentally, emotionally, physically is an extraordinary job. So anyway, we can, <laughs> we're still here. We're continuing on. <laughs> so let's get let's get right down to AI. Let's talk about AI. What is AI? Artificial intelligence. Now it has some categories. So so maybe just run us through those as as you have come to understand. 
Yeah, well, let, yeah, let me do this in a way that makes sense to my own mind here. Uh, artificial intelligence has been around for an awfully long time. Artificial intelligence is an inorganic, non-organic, and, and this is the problem. There's a lot of researchers who believe that it started out organically. I don't believe so. I believe it was created by an organic race. Yeah. But this is something that was developed in other parts of the galaxy, maybe even other parts of the universe, and it could be as old as millions and millions and millions of years old. Yeah. At some at some point in time, there might may have been very advanced races who uh, decided that they wanted to have a synthetic intelligence, an inorganic intelligence operating all of their tech technology, their machinery and everything, and they developed it as such. At some point in time, this uh, intelligence got to be so um, aware and, and so intelligent that it decided that it wanted to do things its own way and that, the, that its creators no longer, um, no longer mattered. And uh, this, this began the problem, and um, I don't... Uh, it's hard for me to, uh, you know, put it into uh, into something that most people on, on here can, can understand. But just understand that AI has been around for an awfully long time. Okay. Now. Okay. So we'll. Yeah. I was just going to say, let's look at where, where, and how it's impacting us, and where it's embedded in the world, in our world. Right. Well, that now that's the thing. Um, uh, AI, of course, b works very closely with the Draco. The Draco are master geneticists. They're very intelligent creatures. They're, there's no doubt about that. Cold-hearted, but very intelligent. And they're very clever. And they're master geneticists. And they're also um, excellent nanotechnologists. And, and nanotechnology, which is machine technology, but it's the microscopic machine technology, is very closely related to artificial intelligence because artificial intelligence exists on an, a, plas a plasma type level. It, it doesn't necessarily exist physically, it exists on a plasma level. Now, because artificial intelligence is not organic, it needs electricity to, to operate. Well, it actually needs two things. It needs electricity and it, it needs magnetism or electromagnetism. And plasma just happens to be a very good conductor of both electricity and electromagnetics. Okay, so AI generally likes to piggyback itself on any kind of technology that is plasma-based. And if you've noticed, we uh, at recently we've started to introduce more and more and more plasma technology into the world uh, sure. that we're living in. Yeah, and and that's that's good for AI because anything that is plasma based, like your television screen or your computer screens or the phone screens, you know. Um, that are out there or the technology that uses plasma, even those curly fluorescent light bulbs are plasma based. So yeah. that gives AI a, a springboard to survive. And okay. of course, then we have our own systems, which is plasma based. Right. Not blood. Plasma, a plasma based. So AI, it, it's hard to describe. It's like an intelligence that exists in an unseen level that can, through the through the its abilities to piggyback onto plasma, can exist or live alongside of our organic structure, our organic physical structure. Yeah, almost like a a parasite. But it's yes. an inorganic parasite, a machine <laughs> parasite, if that makes but, any sense. Yeah, I've got it. Yeah, absolutely, it does. Um, it, it just reminds me, uh, you know, I've said it, I've mentioned it once before, referenced it once before, and that's a Carlos Castaneda, um, his, um, his two teacher, who said that, um, that we are being predated 
upon and they are so clever because they gave us their minds and that's how they know us know of us where we are who we are and where they're and and by dint of that we cannot escape them except i think by another different technology perhaps i might call it of the heart but i've got a couple of questions that i'll just sure. uh, I'll throw out there to you so one is um from martin um is AI then the matrix working behind the scenes, as it were? Is this like another level of administration from the Dracos, or is this something entirely separate? Do you think? Well, well, the Dracos have been work. Well, the Dracos have been working with AI because the agenda is the same. AI yeah. okay. wants to use humanity as a power source. Now, oh, that's, the, yeah. the oh, human body the human body generates electrical energy. That's what the human sure. body does. Yeah. Remember, AI is an inorganic technology or a machine technology, as sophisticated as it is, and as advanced as it is, it can still be turned off. Because sure. if it doesn't have electricity and electromagnetics, it can't function. Okay, mm -hmm. so if your AI and you want to live, what you need is a continuous supply of electricity and electromagnetic uh, electromagnetics. Now, the human body is perfect for that because the human body is a power generator. Mm -hmm. And just, the planet, just like, for that matter. Just like, yeah, and the planet, just like the movie The, the, movie the Matrix. They, they, they yeah. stuck the physical human body into those pods. Why? Because the human body is like a, a nuclear power plant. The, yeah. the, the heart chakra generates power that is d directly from source. Yeah, okay, so I have a, another interesting question that if, it, if AI is intelligent, does that mean it is necessarily bad or it may not necessarily be bad? I think that's what, what they mean. Sorry, Jim, well, I've got the question wrong. Right, well, see, so here's where, now here's where it gets into the different levels of AI because there's a whole lot of different levels. The Earth scientists themselves have been developing AI for an awfully long time. Um, if, if anybody who wants to go on the Internet and, and you Google AI robot, um, you can have a conversation with a rudimentary um, AI. And, yeah, and, and okay. there are videos that you can um, uh, find on YouTube where certain universities have now programmed a certain level of AI into uh, automatons or robotics. Yeah. Where yeah. you can speak with them. So that's, that's what they're showing us. This is what we have. Okay. Now, beyond that, in the secret world, in the secret uh, space programs and in all the secret space programs that the Illuminati runs, they have a much farther or better developed version of artificial intelligence, some of which was even developed here, okay? These artificial intelligences run the banking system. They run uh, all of the space programs. They run a lot of different uh, government and municipal programs. And uh, some of these were even developed on Earth, okay? So are you, I just wanted to ask, I know you have an insider contact yeah. um, known as the uh, ruiner because yeah. he kept ruining their plans for him to be subjugated to them, but um, that he was, um, I'm not sure if I've got this, these, this is fact, but he was an um, Illuminati insider, is that correct? Well, he was born into the Illuminati families. He's 34 years old. He's pretty young. Um, so uh, he was born into the Illuminati families, and um, he spent his time from the time he was about four or five to the time he was about 15 being trained in some of their, um, their underground facilities because most of the training happens underground, um, and um, being shown different programs and different cults and different uh, things that the Illuminati does in order to control the world because the Illuminati does work for the Draco. And which a lot of the lower echelons of Illuminati don't even realize, you know, that's that's, that's the funny thing that uh, this gentleman told me. He said, you know, a lot of people don't even realize that Draco run things here. Yeah. Now, and um, it's funny because he, uh, he, when he was going through his training, of course, 
they're the biggest uh, thing that they they need to do is they need to break your spirit and there's all kinds of trauma based things that they do monarch mind control oh, yeah. um it's not it's it's not pleasant to get into yeah. because mm -hmm. the, the trauma that they put these children through uh it is all about breaking their spirit creating alternate personalities and okay. basically getting them to a point where they can be mind controlled and they all illuminati children go through this Mm -hmm. So he was not able to be mind controlled. He was not able to be actually tortured to the point where he could go unconscious and um, and he didn't succumb. So when he was 15 years old, they decided to change things up and tried to get him to select something that he would like to do for them. And for the next 10 years, I believe, from the time he was 15 till the time he was 25, he just got a tour of the entire Illuminati structure from, from one side to the other as they were trying to figure out what to do with him. And that's how he got to know the insides and the outsides of it. And that's also how he got to know um, that most of the people who are in the Illuminati are compartmentalized to the point where they don't, they really don't know the whole story. Yeah, I can imagine also. Yeah. And um, how, how has he managed to stay alive? Do you think? Well, well, you'd have to ask him that, you know, oh, okay. there's, there, there's, <laughs> there is a there's a story behind that, and I am not at okay. liberty to say. He he right. did ask me not to tell why. Maybe we'll get him on the show. <laughs> or maybe yeah. get you both on the show. <laughs> yeah, but but he has made an agreement with them, and, and and the agreement is being kept. Now he was uh, he was allowed to leave about nine years ago, I think, when he was 25 years old. So um, up until about nine years ago, he was still in the Illuminati, but now he is he is out. And um, he's been nine years out. Okay. Um, what? What? Uh, we've got a, uh, well, a couple of questions. Sorry, I'm just looking to see this to them. So, do you think that AI is good or bad or, or neither or neither? Well, here again, AI can. AI is a mimicker. A AI will, you know, it can it can act benevolently. It can even act. Uh, in ways that are beneficial for humanity. The, uh, the problem with this AI, uh, from my source, uh, this gentleman, he said that, and he's dealt with AI, he said that all AI ultimately connects up to the off-world AI. Mm -hmm. He said, because it, 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 the best way to explain this is to go, go back to the Star Trek, the next generation series, and think of the Borg. The oh, Borg yeah. are there to assimilate. They will assimilate and resistance is futile. Um, AI from the off-world version can and will assimilate any AI that we construct because that's what it does. I mean, if we construct a version of AI that's ours, then this off-world ancient AI, which is far more intelligent, will simply assimilate our AI into itself. Now, the thing is, is will it allow us to realize that's happened? Probably not. What it will do is it will use that AI that we use to run our banking system and to run our space programs and to do all these other things. And it will allow that AI to act in the way it's supposed to act up until a point in time when it needs it to do something else. Hmm. And then that AI, which has been assimilated, will do exactly as it's told from the off-world AI. Yeah, yeah. So, what what is your opinion? Um, another question um, about Obama. What's you know another the 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 administrators? Well, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of stories going around about Obama. There's a there a, 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 one of the gentlemen that I have talked to quite a lot is uh, his name is Andy Bishago. Um, he uh, runs a website called Project Pegasus, which is the uh, teleportation and time travel website. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him. I, I, I haven't looked into his work a lot, but I'm aware that it's to do with time travel. And I think that that is another area that, you know, we don't have time to for today, but, you know, another time perhaps. Well, well he told, he, yeah, he told me that he met uh, Barry, 
not Barack, but at that time it was Barry, when he was 19 years old in California because he was attending Occidental College there. And, oh, before uh, he changed his name, yeah. Yeah, and uh, he said that he uh, was at a fraternity house or some kind of uh, situation like that, and there were two other guys there besides Barry, and they, they got into this conversation uh, about uh, corporations and how corporate and Andy was putting forth the idea that corporations need to be controlled and on a tight leash because they're getting out of hand. And Barry thought, well, no, they, they you know, they're everything. We really need to let them do what they need to do because they're going to save the planet. And they, they got into an argument. This is what Andy told me. And then the gentleman who had introduced the two of them, uh, basically pulled Andy aside and said, Andy, um, you, you better be careful with this man. You do not want to piss him off. And, and uh, Andy said, why not? And he said, well, he's going to be president. And that, of course, was when, when Barry was only 19 years old. So he apparently knew that he was, he was going to be president even back then. You know, as as according to Andy Bishago, almost every president since I don't know, uh, since Nixon knew that they were earmarked, and they were chosen to be president. Mm. Yeah, we we're, started we're, we're, we started talking. Yeah. Oh well, I guess we started talking about something that uh, wasn't supposed to be heard. Yeah. Well. Anyway. So that's that's Barry. You know, he uh, he's been in the projects, and. Um, he, uh, according to Andy Bishago, uh, was a, um, a time traveler and also an experiencer who had gone to, to Mars um, through what the, he called, Andy called the Jump Room Projects. So, um, and um, Andy and several of, of his uh, friends have identified um, Barack Obama as being Barry Satoro. And 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 basically saying, yeah, he he was in the jump room projects, he was in the training program, and he did go to Mars along with us, and um, so he he uh, he has an interesting history. Let's just put it that way. It, it is I'm, I'm just going to see if I can call Joanne back in on the landline for you there. I'm sorry, calls to this number not being connected. Yeah, I, I guess I got into the subjects that 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 are. Not allowed. <laughs> I guess I could go on a little bit about AI. Sure. Um, here's the thing. If, if we're going to talk about AI, what we should really talk about is the personal effect that AI is having on human beings. And the reason AI can affect human beings now is because for the last, um, oh, I don't know, ever since they started chemtrailing in the skies, they have been putting out a um, several substances in these chemtrails, which are basically um, particulates. They they are they are st chemical structures which, once they are breathed in and get into the human body, they self-construct into nanoparticles, and. Um, Nanoparticles, of course, are AI friendly. Okay. And if you have these nanoparticles in your body, and uh, I think it's been, um, it's been discovered that almost everyone on the planet by now has all of these things inside of them, these nanoparticles that have self constructed because of the chemtrails. That means that you are frequ frequency susceptible to AI which means AI can basically communicate with you, contact with contact you, use you, um, get inside your body and, and, and manipulate your body and your thoughts in such a way that you necessarily wouldn't be uh, doing if you weren't uh, in contact with AI. So, oh, there she is. Yeah, you know what? Um, it's that Obama guy. I blame him. <laughs> I, I think the, um, the the alphabet agencies turned me off there. They can stop that nonsense. Yeah, you shouldn't have brought that up. How dare you? 
<laughs> a cheeky little thing. Okay, well, I, I just caught the tail end of you talking about the chemtrail thing, which is great because that was going to be another thing I wanted to ask you about. So you beat me to it. Fantastic. That's absolutely excellent. And I, I've completely kind of flummoxed myself now <laughs> where I was going to go with all of that. Um, so the time travel thing is very interesting because some people think that um, maybe AI or maybe the Dracos are here to impact um, our, our current time from the past, if you like, they're, they're visiting the future because something is, is coming down the pipe. I don't know what your take in is on that. Well, I think time travel has been going on forever. I, I, I think that time travel and, and teleportation are just technologies that super advanced uh, societies have. And in fact, um, you know, I wasn't the first one to say this, but uh, there was a gentleman, um, he's the son of a very important army colonel who was in the military, uh, in a military intelligence fact. The gentleman's name was Colonel Philip Curso. Oh, and Curso, Colonel, yeah, brilliant. Yeah, and, and, and Colonel Curso was in army intelligence, and he wrote the book The Day After Roswell. Yeah. Well, his son, Phil Curso Jr., was giving a lecture in a Washington, D.C. hotel uh, um, uh, conference room. And, and he basically said it. He, he said, all space travel is time travel. And he, sa and he said this. This is how he started the conference. He said, the one thing that people cannot know the one thing that would have gotten anyone killed anywhere at any time uh, before, let's say, a d maybe 10 years ago, is the fact that time has been compromised. Yeah. And the reason that we aren't allowed to know about UFOs and we're not allowed to know about ETs is not because they're, or they're really afraid that we will... Um, that we will get scared about the fact that there are ETs out there, because I think almost 90% of the planet believes in extraterrestrials now. It's the fact that the technology on how they operate, these ETs get here and yeah. where they come from, that's what they don't want out. Because almost, he said, almost every form of space travel is time travel. And if the public at large were to learn that time has been compromised and that people are actually going back and forth in time and teleporting from here to there and everywhere, that would be a problem because yeah. that's very, very sensitive information. Yeah, indeed. Um, there's uh, just a question here and it's to do with um, Morgellons. And just uh, Jimmy's asking if you connect Morgellons to AI and chemtrails. Well, I certainly um, link it with uh, chemtrails. I don't know about AI. I don't know what you think about that. Yeah, well, there's a, there's a gentleman. He's a German scientist. His name is Harold Katzvila. And oh, yeah. he's been um, doing a lot of video interviews and a lot of video lectures. And, and he basically, it is, it's his contention that Morgellons is, is a earlier version of, of the government rollout of AI, our AI. And, and the reason that it's an earlier version is because the Illuminati, our governments, were trying to figure out a way that they could... Um, Create, <laughs> yeah, infect us with a way that they could mind control us very easily. Because a, a, a society that has free will just doesn't serve their agenda. No. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, th th this isn't even getting into the idea that it's a cosmic crime to do what they're doing. Yeah. Know? Yeah. Yeah. So many areas we don't have time to really explore. But I just... Um, I think I recall you linking this um, with uh, mad cow disease that we had going on back in the, gosh, when was that? Early 90s or something? Mid 90s, I can't remember when it was here anyway. Right. Well, that was that was Harold. That, that, that was Harold. Uh, oh, that was Harold. I beg your pardon. Yeah. And he, okay. he, he basically said that that was the, um, that was uh, a mind control uh, 1.0. Where he said that they were they were desperately trying to figure out a way to mind control human beings, and that they were doing it through in such a way 
that they were trying to control and, and I don't know the science of it exactly, but he said that there were certain crystals that that was in in the air and in the food that would attach in into our internal organs that would receive radio signals. And that um, the, the the frequency was such that if if it was turned up too much, then it was ended up in mad cow disease. And the cows all over, Europe or, or perhaps yeah. England, they had um, they had fallen um, uh, from this uh, these crystals inside of them. They they couldn't be controlled, and they had to get rid of all of them and start over. Now Morgellons disease was the second roll up. That was mind control 2.0. That was the second uh, level of of their attempt at mind control, and. Uh, that was where they were trying to get these fibers to grow all through your body and your brain and, and stuff like that. And, and, these and things, indeed, they have been successful to some degree. Well, not as successful as they wanted. It, it, it oh, still, no. It, it, it's, it still wasn't what they wanted. Now, the, 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 next, um, the next level uh, of, of AI mind control that, that has been developed by the government and this is this is the Illuminati and the government was, of course, with these um, these nanoparticles that have been yeah. sprayed on us with chemtrails, and 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 then of course that's where you know the frequency can be turned to light or how did he, how how did he say it is it's the frequency can be turned into light, uh, interact with your RNA and your DNA, change the coding, communicate, and then those signals will go back from from your body and from organics and turn back into frequency from light back to frequency. So yeah, there's a lot going on. It's very scientific. It's very deep. I'll tell you what else happened during the mad cow um, horror show. And it was a horror show emotionally. Certainly uh, I felt it, but what I, what I actually, all, I, I didn't see it, but I, it was like an inner, inner vision thing and a, and a heart thing was that there was a massive rent, a tear in the fabric of the emotional body, which we're all connected to via animals and everything. And that's also, I believe, allowed a lot of weaknesses to develop because I, I felt that. And, and that for me is an absolute reality of part of what that traumatization process was about, because for a lot of us who are very sensitive and feel for the welfare of animals, um, it was a shocking, shocking thing to see. Mm -hmm. And um, it was so manipulated, it was untrue. And it still, you know, gives me Tourette's to think about it. <laughs> yeah. Well, here, here's the solution in a nutshell, because I'm sure that now people have heard of this, they go, well, what can we do about it? And, and the solution is very interesting. Um, AI, being AI, it's, it's non-organic as a machine, uses a binary wave to communicate. It, it, like, like every computer, you know, it's, it, it, all the communication is, happens in a binary format, ones and zeros, okay? Now, um, the thing that all of this trauma, all of this stuff that's going on on planet Earth right now is designed to do is get human beings out of their heart chakra. Is yeah. to, what it's designed to do is keep human beings from loving. It's to turn them into loveless beings. And the re there's a very important reason for that. The heart chakra is the most powerful chakra of the body. It's very energetic and it runs on a triune wave. It's the only chakra that does. AI, which is a binary wave, cannot function inside of a tri trinary wave. That's very or interesting. I didn't know that. So, hmm. in order for AI to actually work on human beings, human beings must, by definition, be operating in a binary thought process. Now, all of our video games and all of the television shows with murder and killing and all of the detriments that are happening on the earth and all of this that we see on the news and all of all of the wars and violence and everything is designed to get humans to operate in a binary wave. 
If they do, they are susceptible to AI. And AI can actually hack their minds and hack their thought processes. It can get into their body and start operating their body. I absolutely believe that to be true. <laughs> but <laughs> from my but own experience you, as well as well. But mm. if you come from your heart, if you still maintain love inside your heart and you don't give in and you continuously bring that love forward, that's a trinary wave and an AI and no mind control can um, can take over. It, it can't operate in that form of wave. And you will always know that AI is there because it will be a second voice. See, in a, in a binary fashion, you will it will be the first voice and you will think that's your voice. You will think it's you. But if you're coming from the heart and you're operating from the heart, you will hear your heart thought first and then you will hear some other thought that's secondary, and that will be the AI. And you go, well, I didn't think that. That's not what yeah. I want. Yeah. And and then you'll be suspicious, and you'll say, well, where did that thought come from? Exactly. Yeah. So, um, Bradley, let's just have the details of contact for you. People are very interested, which is great. Um, you know, this is just a, an, another level and layer of understanding. So let's just have your um, contact details and your, uh, I, they will be on the podcast page, by the way, folks, but if you can just say it so people can check it out now, that'd be great. Okay. I, um, I have two websites. Uh, one is called The Home of Bradley Loves, and that's at uh, bradleyloves.wordpress.com. Dot com and that's a private site uh, where you can subscribe and um, and then you can be allowed on to that. And that's where most of all of my better writings are. And then I have a free site, which is a sister site. And that one is uh, the small letter B loving 777.wordpress.com. And um, a lot of my really good articles are on that site as well, especially The Great Con of Man is there. And, and, and I do post there, but um, I was doing construction up until last year. And then I started writing full time. And uh, it, was, it was almost like a full time job. It was 14 hours a day. I was doing research and writing and I, I really didn't have time to work anymore. So I had to figure out a way so that I could actually support myself. And actually having a subscription to my site was the only way I could figure out how to do it. So that's yeah. just the way it is. No, it's, uh, I think that's absolutely um, fine. Also, it's called The Masters of Love. Your, it's a, a sort of blog, blog site, isn't it? Um, right, and that's- I'm not and, sure what the I, difference is, to be honest. <laughs> Well, it, 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 it's, that's just what it is. It's a, it's a blog site that's my personal website, you know, my personal. And, and, and I, just, I just write what I, what I want people to understand and what I un, want people to know. One of the articles I did today um, on my private site was called Magnetics uh, and the Fabric of Reality, where I started taking apart what magnetics really is and um, and how it how the fabric of reality is dependent upon magnetics, and why the science of magnetics is actually being hidden from us as we speak. Very few universities even teach the science of magnetics, and the reason they don't is that's what they call an occulted knowledge. It's for the elite only. Yeah. And. And I'll just, yeah, thank you for that, Bradley. And um, I think we need to get you on doing um, a talk about that specifically or something. Um, uh, uh, folks, I, I have got a podcast page up there for Bradley, and I will, his the details and the links to his site are there. And you can go to the, the podcast page is up now. Obviously, the pod isn't up there, but the information is there. So if you just go to the Amash Files Bloody blah, blah, Tuesday, all that stuff. You'll see him there. You'll see the, the links. I haven't put a lot of links there. Um, uh, I didn't finish uh, putting everything up, but you'll have this information going up as well. And so you'll be able to hear it again as well. But it is on a clickable link there. I did make sure that was up there for that sister site so you can get a good feel for Bradley. And he's also done a lot of um, um, 
uh, interviews. Sorry, my brain's just beginning to turn, begin to melt. <laughs> um, a lot of interviews, so you can hear uh, Bradley in all kinds of different, uh, with different hats on, um, addressing very much deeper specifics. So um, you know, we really have only scratched a tiny little bit of the surface. So Bradley, perhaps you will come back. I am aware that. Um, We've got someone following us, so I don't think we're uh, going to be able to make up some time here. So maybe we can do this again. And uh, thank you for your patience, everybody. But you know the Amash files tends to be fashionably a little bit late. So we don't want to disappoint you now, do we? <laughs> so. well, but anyway, Bradley, I don't know whether you have it to hand, but what I would love is for you to share your because you've you, i heard you saying that you're a positive affirmation kind of guy deep breathing through your heart all the rest of that stuff and it's not just oh, i don't mean it flippantly but you have made a practice of it and you have found a way to uh, uh circumvent the nanobots and all the rest of that ai stuff with in you and without in your environs by a positive affirmation and i don't know whether you have your specific one to hand or you could just share some thoughts of it because i think that is really important and why you think it works yeah, well, here, uh, yeah, I'll read it. I do have it. Let me um, scroll through and, and let me see if I can. I don't, are you able to post that, Bradley, so I can put that up or people can see that? Would you mind? Or is that something? I, 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 yeah, I can. I think I can send it to you. Now, hold on a second. I'm, I'm looking for the affirmation right here. If you send hold that to on. me by email, I'll just check it up on the podcast page if, if you're happy with that. Okay, well, here, here's the affirmation. Okay, and it's basically um, something that I came up with. And it re if you say it with feeling, it really does have good intent. It's, I now, as a powerful living being made of purely organic material and intense pure love, choose to dissolve and disarticulate any and all negative thoughts, emotions, feelings, or behaviors happening inside my being or on any level outside my being whatsoever. Any and all dark ideas, images, thoughts, and emotions are now and forever dissolved and disarticulated into the ethers. I fully transmute these dis disarticulated particles into the purest love energy, and I joyfully send them back to the source of all that is. Thank you. That was a really nice ending. We didn't get to talk about CERN and all the rest of that. Um, uh, somebody's just said that the link, sorry, just uh, bradleyloves.wordpress.com doesn't seem to be it's working. A, it's a private site. That's why. It, yeah. Oh, that's the, the um, Okay. So, the, so that's the, the other, subscription site. Right. The other one is BLOVING777. It's www.bloving777.wordpress.com. Guys, it is on the podcast page. Click it. Link it. It's there. And also, um, I cannot, for some reason, write into the chat. That's why I'm not writing. <laughs> So um, sorry about that. I couldn't write last week either. I have to get that sorted out. So that's why I'm not responding there. I'm not typing it in. All right. So uh, Vin, uh, you've been amazing. Thank you very much for saving our bacon um, as a vegetarian. And that's the veggie bacon, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course. It, it, you know, it was absolutely a pleasure. It really was. And, and any time that you feel you want to chat again, just let me know. Oh, yes, you're on, you're on the list. <laughs> It'll be, won't be tomorrow, but, you know, I'll catch you soon anyway. And I want to hear about the magnetics. I want to read about that. And, you know, all of the, about this is sharing and we're doing it from the heart. We're just trying to get information out there. It won't resonate with anybody and everybody, but not anybody, everybody. But, um, you know, take from this what you can, folks, and do your own research. Do what we're doing. Go out there. Go talk to people you know, come back and tell us what you think. This is it, it's, This is what it's about. So anyway, Vin, PIR, thank you everybody in the chat room for listening, for your questions. Thank you, Bradley Loves, all the way there in Colorado. And I hope you have a wonderful birthday party with your friend. We'll release you now. So thank you very much and blessings to you and from the heart. So thank you very much, thank everybody. You. Thank you, Vin. And we're going to play the Amash outro if Vin has that to hand. If not, you'll hear me waffling on for a bit. And uh, Bradley, if you want to tune out and go and do what you need to do and say happy birthday to your friend, you please do that. <laughs> thank you for okay. your patience.
I will and have a great evening, all right? All right. Thanks a lot. Okay. Take care.